after I was diagnosed in the hospital here in New York City at NYU Langone, after my surgical biopsy, um, I was assuming that once I got that diagnosis, I would be swept off into treatment, and I was aware of all these medical advancements and I, uh, in, in chemotherapy and oncological care, and I thought, okay, well, you know, maybe I'll just have a pill that I need to take, maybe this will just be a blip on the radar, and nobody even needs to know. I mean, this is how out of touch I was with the whole situation. The experience was completely different. My endocrinologist, who had done the biopsy, I turned to him and I said, okay, what's next? We have the diagnosis. What's the treatment protocol? How do we fix this? Because I need to be fine. And he said, well, I encourage you to find an oncologist, but really the buck stops with here with me. I'm, it's my job to diagnose you and then most people go find their, their care team and their doctor of choice. And usually you get first opinion, second opinion, sometimes third opinion. And it was at this point where I couldn't believe that I had gotten myself to a, an illusion of a finish line and a goose chase was just about to start. It was three days after I was diagnosed with surgical tape on my neck and the tiniest bit of information on what I had. No stage, uh, no type, it just was Hodgkin lymphoma. And if you Google that, um, there it's a wide variety of outcomes and it can be aggressive, it can be uh, slow progressing, many options so stay away from Google but it was literally three days of my mother Matt and me on the phone calling MSK while Cornell um, any, any cancer center who would take me and here I am in New York City surrounded by the best centers and care in the world and I was getting given a three month waiting time. And I actually had to say to the administrator on the phone that I just got diagnosed yesterday and based on what I'm reading, I'm not sure that I will make that appointment in July. I actually had to say those words, which was incredibly terrifying for me to actually articulate that. Um, and come to that realization, but it was the craziest experience trying to get into treatment. And I'm I'm not even saying we're pulling ropes with like friends of friends and who went to this doctor for their cancer. I mean, we're calling all of our cancer friends to see wh whose doctor we could go to. And these again weren't just strings. We were pulling maritime ropes to get into care. And um, luckily, thank God, by five connections removed, I got into uh, to see Dr. John Leonard, who's head of the lymphoma program at Weill Cornell. He's, he's world renowned and I, I cannot believe my luck that I got into to uh, be treated with him and his team. Um, but really it was it was the beginning of, you know, a, a very grueling treatment schedule, but at a time when I thought everything would be easy and once you got the diagnosis, you can, you know, float right through into treatment. Um, it, was, it was a very different experience. So I, I encourage anybody who's going through this uh, to stick with it and to corral your, those close to you and, and put them to work, put them on, your, on the phone, um, you're going to be tired. Side effects that I found um, in my treatment specifically, again, it was an infusion every other week and um, really I felt physically woozy and loopy um, 
after the infusion on that afternoon and I, I would just, I would come back to my apartment, um, usually accompanied by whoever came with me that day. And I would, my, I would just kind of crawl, crawl into bed and have what really helped me with settle my stomach and things like that um, was a cranberry juice and soda. And I, would have it in a wine glass, which made me feel luxurious. <laughs> Just, uh, it was one of the many little ways to, to treat yourself um, into thinking that you're having more of a, a spa day than an infusion. <laughs> but um, the next day I would sleep a lot and I would just feel, it was like the worst hangover for three days after that infusion basically every other week. Um, that's the best way I can describe it. It's lightheadedness. Um, even brushing your teeth would make you feel drained. And I remember I would have to rest on the sink to catch my breath, even just like after putting pants on. It was, uh, it was three days for me of, you know, uh, rest and a little bit of nausea. I actually only, grew up once, uh, weirdly, before dinner one time, um, and then it was gone. Other people have had different experiences, um, but my, uh, my care team definitely prescribed me all the anti-nausea medicine and anti-acids and all this. I think I had like 12 prescription bottles on my bedside table at one point. Um, so they definitely, there are fixes for, um, the worst side effects, which are, are nausea and sleeplessness. Um, I turned to holistic support as much as I could. It wasn't realistic for everything, but as much as I could, I used um, natural medicine and homeopathic support to, to help me in any way that I could. It, if it didn't work, I stopped doing it, but I tried it at least. Um, the top things that helped me for the worst side effects were for sleeplessness and, and anxiety, of course, acupuncture opened up a whole new method of care for me. Um, it was incredibly impactful for me to um, help me get a higher quality of sleep, to fall asleep, um, to feel less anxious, to just kind of take it down a notch from like an eight to a three. Um, again, it wasn't perfect, but it really helped um, in support of everything um, else I was doing on the, the Western medical side. Um, for hurrying up the kind of nausea and restlessness in those three days for helping to detox out um, the, the chemo and kind of keep it moving through your body an Epsom salt bath every day for 30 minutes. I mean, not just like a little bit of Epsom salt, I put like four cups in and that's a homeopathic remedy. It's called a shaman's bath. If you do four cups of Epsom salts and a box of baking soda, and it's, it's super powered detoxing, um, which was incredibly helpful. It, if I didn't do that, and I ran this experiment, <laughs> if I didn't do that, the, the nausea and the fogginess and the kind of toxic weight feeling after that infusion, after every infusion, it went away 24 hours sooner. So if you're able to help yourself detox out the, uh, the chemo and, and get it moving through your body, it's the best thing you can do. Um, Again, in that effort to kind of like speed up the hangover and kind of get it over with, so it's in a condensed three to four days, was um, tons of water. I drank so much water. I was craving water. Um, the thing that made the most difference actually after the infusion, when I was feeling really nauseous that afternoon, um, I would drink a liter of water and I didn't feel like it, but honest to God, if I didn't drink it, I felt so terrible the next day. Again, it's just another way to get the chemo moving through you and out. 
um, get it to do its job and then be gone. So the worst thing you can do is to you know let it kind of stagnate in there, and um, it's it those three things made the world a difference. So going through treatment um, with ABVD for Hodgkin lymphoma, I noticed most side effects after the second treatment. Um, again, I had never experienced anything of this magnitude. I had obviously never done chemo before. I knew what it looked like, and that was scary enough. Um, however, I the, the turning point where I, I knew that I really needed to help myself through this was after my second infusion, I noticed, you know, my, my hair was starting to thin on my pillow when I woke up, hair was on, you know, my spot on the sofa, it was on the back of my coat, that, and I was okay with that, I was expecting that. What I wasn't expecting was the loss of my words, and that's really when I realized that I need to do anything that I can to help myself get through the next the next six months because it can this cancer can take my hair and the chemo can make me feel sick and that's okay I was okay with that but it cannot take my words um, I was struggling to finish sentences and I was it was almost like I had the word on, on the tip of my tongue but I just I couldn't get it out and it was for somebody who loves writing and I'm I'm very verbally expressive and and at a time especially when I needed to communicate how I felt having the tools needed to do that taken away was was unfathomable for me So the hair started to go around the third infusion, and it really thinned from the third to the fifth um, more and more intensely. I was terrified to lose my hair, and I had long blonde hair at this point. It was very much a part of my identity. I was the most scared because I felt that losing my hair in front of the world would change how they perceived me, how my friends looked at me, how strangers in the grocery store stood behind me and you know saw all the hair coming out on my the back of my coat. I remember making sure to always kind of wipe off my yoga mat if, you know, I was in downward dog and my hair started falling out on my hands, which that did happen. Um, it came to a point where the hair just started to keep coming and coming and I actually, I was following myself literally around the apartment, scooping up handfuls of hair from the sofa, from the sink, from the bathroom, on the towel, so Matt didn't see it. Um, because I knew that it was traumatic for him as well. Um, it was maybe after the, the fourth treatment that I decided that I was going to cut it. And I originally, because I'm, I'm a little bit of an extremist, <laughs> I thought I was going to just buzz it right off the bat, but actually I went out to brunch with my friends that morning and my hair was in a, in a tight bun so it could all stay on my head. And we had about a bottle of champagne between the five of us and we went to the hair salon and I said, okay, this is gonna be a celebration because the medicine is working and that means that the hair is going. So I said to the stylist, I said, just let's buzz it this is the situation, I'm ready for it. And she was very, very gentle, very kind. And she actually advised 
that let's go short first and then do this in two phases because I don't want you to be shocked with, with the transformation. It was a transformation on many levels. Um, it changed how I saw myself in the mirror. It changed how other people saw me. And I originally felt that being, you know, bald because I had cancer and having this kind of duck fuzz on my hair, uh, on my head, I thought that it made me seem broken and less than and sick and weak. And I didn't realize that that's not what people see. People see bravery. They see a badass when they see that. And I wish I had realized that earlier than wor worrying so much about that change in identity and that change in perception, that change in how I look. Because looking back at those pictures, I looked really strong. I looked really good. And I am so proud of that. So please give that as a sign of hope if you're going through this, uh, because it's something to embrace. It will pass, it does grow back. And it was an illuminating experience on a personal level, um, one that I got a lot of growth out of. I want you to know that having cancer, it changed my life, um, which is an obvious thing, but it created a whole new sense of self and a whole new life trajectory that I didn't know was possible. And I wish you all the healing and love as you go through this journey.